So what I have to say right now, you know, like every teacher in a third world country, um, I went to a craft store and got the supplies for the kids because the state of Georgia is not going to do it. And I noticed that my color pens are dying out. So we have new pens, more colors, fresher. Let me give you a lightning review of where we are. The goal of this course is to teach you how to deal with kind of systems, dynamical systems, typically systems that evolve in time, uh, that almost anybody who does research uh, will encounter sooner or later. So that's what we are teaching. Now there is a definition, we have to define the subject, and I told you abstractly it means it, it's a state space, which is typically some finite or maybe even infinite dimensional system, but you know, for purposes of this course, one, two, or three dimensional, not much more than that. And uh, a state is what you can define with arbitrary precision. So if you specify with arbitrary precision, you know, where am I and which way I'm going, then we can start uh, our discussion. And our discussion then has is, if these are the states that uh, whatever problem I'm looking, you, looking at, uh, the system can explore, uh, what law does it follow? Now, usually somebody hands you down the law and uh, this is a rule. <coughs> In this course, this rule is infinitely perfect. So if I tell you where I am and which way I'm going with arbitrarily fine precision, the law tells me what's going to happen a second later, a minute later, a year later, millennium later. So that's a vast idealization in many ways. But it's quite powerful because you, we can never specify initial states sharply enough and we don't feel so confident that Newton law describes black holes, let's say. So, you know, it only has limited applications and all our observations will be noisy and all computations will be rounded off or discretized, digitized. So it's not obvious that this is going to work at all, but it turns out it gets us a long way. And the great idea that happened about 150 years ago is that the law, which is usually written as an equation, and often an equation that one can explain and, you know, at least empirically justified, but typically it's an axiom that we start with after having discarded other possible laws, uh, in 19th century, and some people who know how to use Mathematica can do it even today, you could find analytic solutions to number of problems. Now, analytic solution means there is something that's well-defined mathematically, like Bessel function or Mary G function or some such thing. And you show that that object uh, gives you the solution. And the problem with that approach is that it's very hard to connect your equations to these solutions, you know, mentally to understand what solutions should look like. And it turns out that a lot of the time, even though the solution is there and has a name of some dead white person, uh, it doesn't help you very much because you have no idea what this function does, even though it's a name function. So the great progress, which uh, we are very grateful today because this jives very nicely both with experiments and numerical computations we can do 
in the last 20, 30 years, is that you can think of solutions qualitatively. And that has names, you know, topology, etc. But basically, you can say, well, I don't know what the thing will do precisely, but it'll do something like that. So what you do is you start looking at the flows, and you start saying, well, if it's a low-dimensional flow, certain things can happen. Um, uh, you know, I find out very useful notion that there are actually some situations where law tells you nothing happens. They're called fixed points. And they're easier to compute either qualitatively, numerically, or analytically than the all other solutions. But it turns out that they kind of organize the world of things that can happen. So in this one-dimensional examples we're doing this week, they um, tell you that if I'm in a neighborhood of the fixed point, then I either go away from it or go toward it, uh, if I'm moving at all. And because in one dimension, I'm not allowed to change my mind, I start going backwards, because if I try to do that, I would come to velocity zero at some point, and then nothing would happen. So it's a very powerful way to think about the flow without computing and it gets you a long way. Now we learn another thing that uh, doesn't maybe seem so important to you, but it's extremely important in a general way of dealing with nonlinear problems. <laughs> but we learn how to do mathematically a precise statement uh, how stable or unstable given solution is, meaning, you know, how quickly I converge or run away from, in this case, only equilibria, fixed point. But this notion that you can look at trajectory in its neighborhood carries very nicely to arbitrary dimensions. And Chris, who, you know, pretends to be listening to us, but is doing something much more interesting right now, um, uses it in hundreds of thousands of dimensions when he describes fluids. So this supports very nicely. And it's a basis of, you know, how we think about geometry. We think about geometry of these state spaces, not just by points and trajectories, but actually charts, you know, a map that covers Georgia versus map that covers Oregon and all charts in between that enable us to get from that. And they're all flat pieces of paper. They're examples of linear stability. And as you'll see, we'll also use it today when we study bifurcations. The other thing that I would pull out from what we have done so far is this notion of potentials, which are not really potential because in one dimension, example, we're doing now, it's you know impossible to describe both position and velocity of the particle um, in a state space. We don't have any more dimensions to do that. That's called Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics. In that case, potentials are very precise in the sense that their gradients uh, tell us what the forces are, what the accelerations are here. But here, the kind of simple thing that says that if you have a potential, if you have a function, now what's the big about, you know, both Hamiltonians, if you ever get to them, we will actually in this course. And potentials, it was an amazing thing that they discovered in beginning, you know, end of, well, French Revolution and beginning of uh, 19th century, they discovered that it's possible to write one function. So you can take all your state space coordinates, you know, thousands of bits of information, you put them into this thing that is called, let's say, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and you get one number out of it. So it's a very, you know, you take thousand things and you get one thing out. So you think, you know, 
what's the big deal? Well, then they show you that uh, when you vary a little bit uh, the result that you have, all of these dimensions come back and you can reconstruct all the equations of motions of many of degrees just from a single function. So that was an amazing discovery. And um, in this particular case, if you kind of know what you're trying to find, for example, you're trying to find fixed points, you can construct a function called quote unquote potential such that it doesn't produce force, that will be a second derivative, it just produces velocity. But that velocity has a property, you can you know, simply show that this is true, that every place, wherever you start, that velocity which you get just by varying uh, your potential, will always point downward, it will always point toward the bottom. And here's, you know, some simple example in few dimensions that people use often in various applications, especially in biological and chemical applications. But you can generalize this to 10 to 11 neurons and study uh, in the same spirit systems with very, very many variables in terms of their potentials. And in that case, uh, this kind of uh, landscape that I draw here just in one line is, you know, a topographical map of Himalayas, but the Earth is 10,000 dimensional, a million dimensional. And what you're finding out, what are possible valleys in this? And that has many names in both neuroscience and engineering. Uh, so this is so-called optimization problem. So they have a very different flavor that what I told you, dynamical systems are. Dynamical systems just march mindlessly forward in time. But this is the first glimpse that you may be able to solve problems intelligently without not marching at all, just um, uh, having some ways of uh, rolling down into the right answers. Uh, very important thing. So these are the things that I find interesting as ideas. There are you know, other things we discussed, like blow-ups and singularities, which is more like mathematics. It's no big deal. But these are really powerful ideas. Today and for a few lectures from now on, we will do something that's called bifurcations. And the bifurcations, uh, I'll explain soon what the word is. They start, you know, in your experience as a child very soon, but in terms of mathematics and uh, mathematical description of the world, we credit the foreign worker Leonid Euler uh, working in St. Petersburg, uh, a make-believe city, modern city, and a totally savage country of slavery, basically. Uh, You know, by the time he was in school, they taught him ideas that came from Hook originally, but the ideas were that you push something, it resists, you know, it pushes back, it's action equals reaction. You push it harder, it resists harder. And that's called linear problems, so harmonic oscillators are of that kind. But this is not what your life is like. You have climate, you push it, it kind of uh, responds, you push it harder. Uh, and if you push it too hard, suddenly there'll be a bifurcation, which I'll explain. And suddenly climate will change catastrophically. You know, the Gulf Stream will turn around and go someplace else and Europe will freeze and stuff like that. And it's not, um, you know, science fiction, it's just simple mathematics. 
And this says that whenever you have realistic problems, nonlinear turns will come in, which will explain how systems uh, respond when you really start pushing them. And, uh, and you have intuition about it. So for example, what started Euler So Euler is German Swiss. So Germans pronounce these two first letter as Oi. So his name is not Euler or something, it's Euler. If you have a beam, uh, which is you know mounted vertically on the ground, and you put a brick on it. Then uh, if the brick is light, nothing much happens. But now you keep adding and adding the weight and suddenly will, something will happen that you know always happens when you push these things too hard. Suddenly the thing will change its shape totally from being cylindrically symmetric. It'll become a bent rod with no symmetry. And depending on this weight, you know, it might be able by its torsion to still maintain it <coughs> or other horrible things can happen. <clears throat> but the first thing that happens is like that, and that's a bifurcation. Again, I'll explain the word in a second. And the main idea of this is, is that you have a system, but you're changing a parameter. So you know, this is weight, one kilogram, and this is maybe six kilograms. So this is the parameter of your problem you're changing. And the behavior of system is different depending on what this parameter does. So that's why we thought we got everything we could possibly get out of one dimensional dynamics, you know, dynamics on the line, because we learned that such dynamics can either have fixed points, they're attractive or repulsive, or you can run off to infinity if the line is infinite, and that's all you could do in the first few lectures. But what you can actually do is you can change your system and see what consequences this has. So this is not a dynamical phenomenon. This is kind of an external change of parameters of the system. And that's what you do in all possible experiments. You know, for example, you put oil in the pan and you put the heat on. And in the beginning, nothing happens because heat diffuses through the oil. But at some point, you're putting so much heat that buoyancy kicks in and you start having some motions in the beginning, Lego, et cetera. And this happens every place and all the time. And it's so rich that faculties now for century and a half, <laughs> math faculty, but also engineering faculties are filled with people who only do this, do bifurcations. And to make it easier, they only concentrate on what happens very close to this thing, you know, when I put 5.3 kilograms and it's almost ready to go. So they, I call them epsilon people. They only look at the epsilon deviation. And it's so rich uh, that uh, you can do lots of interesting stuff. Now, science, climate, et cetera, doesn't care. It often goes to extremes, which are nothing like this. So the first set of extremes with these bifurcations, you know, things really change their behavior, their shape. And the second half of the course, uh, we will get chaos. You know, things will go really crazy. <laughs> uh, but uh, that will happen after some sequence of bifurcations, which we will study. Uh, Lots of people study this and, uh, in lots of languages and cultures, etc. And they tend to give the same thing uh, different names. So we will now look at the simplest possible kind of bifurcation. 
which is called saddle node bifurcation. And, you know, when mathematicians or physicists or chemists say saddle node, they actually visualize the saddle in many dimensions, like a ridge of the mountain, which uh, you go up on one side, but you go down. So in higher dimensions, that's what this thing will look like. Now, in one dimension, they don't look like that, but they're just special case. So that's why they have a strange name. It'll make more sense when you get to them later. So here is an example. A one-dimensional equation of kind we already studied has some parameter called R. And it's not linear. And first nonlinear thing is x squared, something that multiplies itself. So here is a very simple equation. And now what you study in bifurcation theory, you say, well, this is actually a continuous family of the systems because R, this parameter, can be very large negative number or it could be a very large positive number, et cetera. So what will happen then? So when R is negative, then parabola you know, starts at the value of R someplace here, but it's a parabola, it's a function. It grows positive, so it goes up on both sides. At some point, velocity, which used to be negative, turns out to be positive. And this function just goes on. And then we do our analysis that we have done so well before. We find out that, you know, this is positive velocity. So here I'm being sent this way. This is negative, so I'm being sent this way. So that means that this fixed point where velocity is zero is attractive. Whereas the other fixed point, uh, open circle, is repelling. Then comes the critical moment. In profession, this is called co-dimension one, meaning you can do it in 10,000 dimensional system, but you only have to change one parameter like the, you know, heating on your hot plate or something. And there is a very special point where stable and unstable point coalesce because your R is at zero and your function looks like that. And it's one of these, you know, fragile things on the left hand side, it flows in. On the right hand side, it flows away because velocity is positive. And this thing, the value of R is called many things, but you know, it's called either a critical value because things go critical, you know, the climate flips or uh, or uh, the way that Euler called it. He called it bifurcation, by bi meaning two. And furcation, fur is the number of branches in Latin. So you get two branches. Now, in general, we'll study all kinds of bifurcations and often they will have more than two branches. But, uh, you know, this is where the name comes from. And uh, we use it just to say this phenomenon happened. My behavior changed totally. I used to have an interval where I was marching to the left and this one is gone, wiped out. And then an amazing thing happens for this system, which is as I, make R slightly positive, the lowest point it reaches this parabola is here. 
And now what's happening is that I march to the right, I march to the right, I march to the right, I march to the right. So the dynamics even doesn't know that there is this parabola there. Now, if I start in this situation and decrease the parameter, suddenly something will happen that I didn't expect. So that's the reason why this kind of bifurcation is sometimes called blue skies bifurcations. You know, everything is fine. You're just marching in one direction, but somebody is pumping car carbon you know, dioxide into the atmosphere. What do you care? And uh, at some critical point, this thing hits you. And this is a very uh, measurable, very common thing. So when people study turbulence, very often turbulence looks what's called laminar, it has nice, simple structure. But then things like that, that come from nonlinear term in Navier-Stokes equations, sneak upon you as a new changing the velocity of your fluid Reynolds number, suddenly something happens of this nature as a blue sky thing, and uh, it's immensely important. So that's about bifurcations. And the only thing I can say is, you know, if I don't measure the velocity, I won't even know there is anything here, but there is a way, um, you know, there are many ways of uh, striking alarm before bifurcation happens, before climate flips. And one way is that as you decrease this thing, the velocity around here will slow down because R is smaller and smaller. At this point, it's zero. So even though you don't know that somebody is lurking out there in the blue skies, you should get suspicious when, as you're marching down the line, suddenly there's a pileup. It's very slow, and then you go fast again. Something is here. And in mathematics, you can do this very pretty. You can complexify all the variables, and you can say that there is a root of quadratic polynomial, which is in the complex plane. And both in classical and quantum mechanics, that's a very powerful thing of uh, predicting things. Now, bifurcations are everywhere. And if you were in higher dimensions, you know, right now we can still write one dimension is velocity. The other one is, I mean, uh, position or state of my system. And the other one is the rate of change, the state of my system. These are two numbers. I can draw them on a piece of paper. This will almost never happen again. It will be many uh, degrees of freedom. So you have to find more efficient way of describing what's going on. So there are a few other representations that people like when they're describing bifurcations. You know, all of them are very cute and obvious. So you could say, for example, that when R is larger than zero, then I have this phenomenon that everybody just marches on. Then there is a critical value of my parameter where I neither push you nor slow you down. So R equals zero. And then what happens is that as I go from the left, I, uh, you know, I march along, but I have to slow down. Something's going on. So I have to stop. So this is an attractive fixed point from the left. But uh, as I, if I start any place on the right, I just run away. And then uh, there is the other qualitative phase when R is negative. And then I find out, you know, quite interesting behavior which says, I start on the left, but then I got glued in a fixed point. But then there is an interval where everybody is marching in the opposite direction. They all get here. 
And if I go away, far away from this neighborhood, don't look at details, everybody's marching to the right again. So that's one way to do this. And uh, you can stack these guys on top of each other, these pictures, and you know, just connect the stable and unstable lines by lines. And you'll find out that as a function of R, you know, this is a quadratic thing, you'll find out that stable ones, let's, let me call them dark brown or something, these fixed points, uh, as I increase R, you know, they get closer and closer to the critical value, but everybody is stable. But if I get to the other side, formally, I have fixed points on a line, these guys, but they're unstable. So there is a branch of fixed points, and I you know, see bifurcation again, but there is a branch of fixed points which are stable and branch of fixed points which are unstable. And that's one way to draw it. Now, in this way of thinking, X is not very important. You know, I'm just trying to find qualitative behavior in X, which either I go left, stop, or I go right. So not a big deal. What's really important is my parameter. So you will often see this picture turn on its side, saying that um, as I change the parameter, here is the critical point, and then there are these guys on a negative edge. And these guys on the positive branch. And you know, this is awkward because you uh, used to think of X as a horizontal variable, but now it's been turned into a vertical variable because the most important thing about describing is the parameter. So that's a plot and then name come out, you look at this picture. So some people call this bifurcation fold by bifurcation. Others one say, well, that's a turning point. You know, I, I've been attracted, attracted, I brought here. If I get on this side, I'll go this way and uh, turn in the opposite direction, go unstable. I already told you that's called blue sky. And then the most unappealing name of all, which is the official name, this is a saddle point. Saddle node. So no just means, you know, there is a point. And uh, I have to admit that I myself very frequently forget what these things are supposed to be. So, you know, I have to, because there's so many names, it's zoology or bifurcation points, I have to go and check in a Wikipedia which bifurcation this really is. Now, it wouldn't happen to Chris Crowley because he knows his bifurcations, but I am often confused about them. So now uh, the book has a bunch of examples. They're all very nice, I like them. So here is one example. I have a law that says the velocity with which I move is controlled by my parameter, then if I was very naive, I would say, well, but then, you know, it cares about the value of the X proportional to it, so there'll be a linear term. And then what happens whenever you solve equations which are first order and second order, but certainly first order, you always find out that exponentials creep in because they happen to be solutions because uh, the exponentials are things that whose derivative is exponential, you know, it's in a proportion to themselves. So you might end up looking at something which is an exponential function of Vx. 
just an example, not unrealistic. It happens very often, both in chemistry and um, yeah, neuroscience or biophysics and various kinds. So now we are told whenever this happens, what, what are directives? Well, find fixed points, so find x equals zero. Well, that's easy. It says, you know, this equation says zero equals uh, r minus x. And if it so pleases me, I can put this guy on this side. Now that's a transcendental equation. I mean, it's a perfectly good equation, but um, yeah, it's kind of, there is no close formula for this other than what you see in front of your eyes here. But we know what to do. Uh, this is a function of x and this is a function of x. So let's just plot both of them. So here is my plot of x dot and x. And one of these functions is exponential. So exponential, you know, has value of natural logarithm for zero. And then because it's negative upstairs, so when I go to the left, it grows like exponentials do. And it exponentially falls off to the right. So this is um, function e to the minus x. This one, I know how to do. This is just a line. So it crosses at value r, and it, uh, it's 45 degree line. In this case, it looks like that. So that means there are two fixed points if you know r is larger than natural logarithm. One is here, one is there. We're supposed to look at this combination. So this guy happens to be stable, and this guy happens to be unstable. And I march this way, and that way, and that way. And this we all already did last week. But what happens at bifurcation? So. Where is bifurcation? Well, the bifurcation happens when these two guys, you know, right now I have two fixed point. If I decrease R, I'll have one fixed point or no fixed points, like we already did. So the bifurcation will be exactly the moment these two guys are tangent to each other. So one is a curve. Tangent means they need to have the same slope. So that's going to say uh, that um, dx e to the minus x should be d, d, dx of the right hand side, or minus x. This is minus one. And this brings a minus out, so this is minus, and it's exponential, so it just reproduces itself. <coughs> and that says, and that's a fixed point. We usually use star to describe solutions of this, that's a fixed point. So it says that, you know, X will happen at zero. That's where any number to the power zero is one. So I can tell that X star is happening at zero. 
but now I have to find critical value of my bifurcation parameter. And that I obtain by inserting it here, and I find that e to the zero equals one. This is zero equals r. So this is my critical parameter, rc. So this is prototype of all these kind of examples. Before we were only finding fixed point, but now we have to do an additional thing. We have to vary a parameter to count how many fixed points are and uh, when they merge, that's instant or bifurcation in terms of parameters, and that's what we call bifurcation. So now comes a good idea, uh, again, due to Henri Poincaré, a young uh, gifted professor of mathematics in Paris at the end of 20th century. And it's as good and it's same idea as this one idea, this idea. You know, when we studied linear stability, it turned out to find out that my neighbors go away or stay with me. It was sufficient to look at a very small neighborhood so I could approximate, no matter how complicated the function was, by its first derivative evaluated there. So that's the only information I take from the function. And that they gave me local linear stability and the dynamics will go here. So basically it says, we have a nonlinear problem, but you know, take a Taylor expansion, keep the first term, see, see how that works. And that has a name, which says, there are very, very many different systems, equations with various shapes and parameters, etc. But if I look close to the bifurcation, there is something called normal form. And the idea is very simple and it's used all the time. So, uh, for example, you know, this uh, velocity here changes from being as negative as possible and then it starts decreasing. So that's some kind of critical formula. So I can associate this the first derivative of this function well, I can, with the little neighborhood, this function, I can associate a, a value. But it's a nonlinear function, so it's not only that we need to know I'm a bottom of the well, but it's a very useful information to know, uh, you know, how steep this well is. Is it a, like a very narrow hole, or I am in a plane which looks flat to me, but actually I'm at the bottom a very gentle thing. And for that, you keep the next derivative, the second derivative. And you say, and now you can use it in two ways, depending on your problem. Uh, you say locally, when I look at my neighborhood, it looks parabolic because very close to my critical point, there might be higher order terms in Taylor expansion or critical point, but they're so small, I don't notice them. So you say, you know, locally there is a parabola. Now, if you were doing this in a problem having to do with mirrors, which are curved, you might find it actually more convenient to say that there is a circle you know so there is a circle that fits in this hole it's not too small or too wide if it was too big i couldn't reach the bottom if it was too small you know i i didn't hug the walls close to it so there is a critical circle and you can say the curve has a, a radius of curvature, but at the present situation, it's actually good enough for, to say that all problems will have a gentle behavior around the critical point, 
can be thought of as parabolas, locally so. So that's the first idea of normal form. The second idea is that, you know, you might have done this in imperial gallons or whatever was your measuring system. And, you know, the velocity might have been measured per eye blink of the emperor or whatever. Um, so then you do the next thing is you only keep the shape. You redefine your variables by constants until you only keep the shape in just absolutely minimal number of parameters, and that is called a normal form. And uh, it's a very powerful idea that's used all over engineering and physics and everything else. So uh, to go back to our example, we are looking at x dot equals r minus x minus, you know, a function whose name we know it's exponential, but we don't actually know it unless we draw it by the point. And we know that this function has a critical value one, three point one two in Stroger's book. We know it has a critical value at which. Uh, bifurcation happens. And we know also in the space where this happens. In this example, it was at the origin. Now we use this idea that we only keep the leading behaviors. So we write this as a critical point, which is one. And then deviation from the critical point. So that's first order uh, effect in the critical series. So this is really, you know, RC, RC, just very simple in our case here. So that was linear, so there isn't much else to do. I mean, in parameter, it wasn't a complicated function. However, in a spatial variable, it was very complicated because Taylor expansion of exponential has uh, all orders of x to the n in it. But what you say, well, I'll take minus x minus, and now I start expanding this one minus x plus, this is just Taylor expansion of an exponential. And if you need to, you can go in a higher order, but for this normal form, we keep the first non-vanishing thing. And what I notice is that this cancels this term and that term, they cancel. And this cancels. This one's cancel. So I find that my problem is really R minus RC in parameter world minus this term here. You know, that, what that's saying is that when I look at the difference between the tangent and the curve, the first term that survives is the quadratic term. So that's this term here. And this normal form is good to some order. So it's good to x cubed. And depending on my problem, this is good enough. But now we have done this already, right? So this looked very different. This problem looked very different from the one we did before. 
this one. But that's, you know, a problem like this just with minus x rather than x here. So essentially the same problem. So what we find is that, um, you know, we have mapped this general problem into a normal form. In this particular case, just r minus x squared. If I rescale things by square roots on both sides, etc., I can bring it to this form. And if I understand the normal form, I can apply it to all the systems which locally look like, uh, you know, parabolic approximations to some more general function. I can make this more fancy, so. So then, the fancier I make it, the less you understand, but I can just say, well, you know, so what this says is that uh, in general, I have an equation which looks like x dot. I'm still in one dimension, but now I have function that velocity depends where I am in, what state I am in, but also depends, you know, how hard I'm driving the system, my parameter. Then I work and I find a fixed point. So I say, well, there is a fixed point, and there is a critical value, RC, of my parameter. Plus, uh, the linear distance in parameter space from the critical value, because I'm interested in R, not the critical one, times the first term with respect to R, the parameter. Then I'm not really at a fixed point, I'm a little bit away from the fixed point. So I also have to measure that distance and how much that cost depends on the derivative of my velocity, so-called velocity gradient, how much velocity direction and strength when I move in state space. So that's that thing. And then uh, if I want to capture the first nonlinearity, the first nonlinearity is almost always, it's, it's rather hard to produce functions that locally don't scale like parabolas, but have some weird powers. It's possible to do if you have, if you impose it symmetries on a problem, but it's not natural. So this kind of almost always works for smooth functions. So I have to, find out, you know, uh, what's the parabolic coefficient and the derivative here is called curvature. You know, from here, this is like radius of curvature in mirror problems. But anyway, it's a second derivative, which you see really a lot in all kinds of problems. And that's a general form of normal form. Unless I add some other constraints, so this is now other constraints can be very, very powerful. So 
if I say physics tells me that you know moving to the left or to the right uh, shouldn't make any difference because I ha don't have intrinsic definition of what's left and right, then it suddenly constrains terms and this term cannot show up or the even term show up. So in general, you also have to think about symmetries. And by the time you do this, it's a subject, it's called catastrophe theory. And it's a, a list of all possible catastrophes that can happen in uh, all small dimensions, because as you go to a higher and higher dimension, things get more and more complicated. But generally, you expect that no matter what you're doing, even if you're not able to measure or don't know your equations uh, accurately enough, you expect to have this some parameter. Uh, and first response to the changing parameter is linear. And if you put yourself at a critical point, the first response of things uh, being pushed left to right uh, is quadratic. And this is a very good fit starting assumption for many problems where you don't have either sufficient measurements or you, you don't have the detailed equations that tell you how to compute these coefficients. But as parameterizations, that's very good. You can say that I uh, am trying to find something that's well behaved. Uh, and to do that, it's enough to do locally a second order Taylor expansion, and I find. But in the real world, uh, you have to do lots of stuff. You don't have a freedom to move everything. So, for example, in the real world, there is death. Death is a fixed point, and you can, you know, maybe you can not pay taxes, but death you're not going to avoid. So, if you are describing some system uh, of, you know, some general like population systems that we did with for holes, we actually forced to have one of the fixed points of certain kind, and we are not allowed to vary the parameter around it. And whenever this happens, uh, you know, transcritical bifurcation that I'll just go through, which will be obvious once I explain it. If you remember, we had, we had our Holst. We had some po population thing. This was x, x start. And there was a curve. And it said that, you know, if I have environment is some amount of food and I have very small population, that population will grow until it starts exhausting the environment. And if there is too much, it'll die again. You know, so that's, that was the idea of Verhulst. Now today, you know, this is too naive, but we have better versions of it. So in transcritical, uh, bifurcation, we say death is given. So I'm not allowed to vary some parameter that removes that particular fixed point. It just has to be there. And in this particular Verhulst example, it's very easy to write a function that does what you want it to do. So that's going to be a function. Velocity is proportional to the x. So when x goes to zero, velocity will be zero. But you know, there is more to this story. So you will have some parameter which tells you what's the growth rate when x is very small. And then uh, you will exhaust that. So that will give you the other fixed point. So yeah, that's a typical quadratic equation of that kind. So now when I look at that kind of system, if R is negative, then I have negative slope here. So this is R smaller than zero. So this 
parabola. You know, when x goes very large, this is a big uh, negative number. So parabola has to point down. And it'll have some point. The death is attractive fixed point. Uh, you know, if I'm on the wrong side, I get ejected. You know, on this side, I get sucked up by death. So that happens for negative R. Now, what's the critical parameter? A well, critical parameter, you know what it is. It's when these two guys coalesce. So what happens is when R is zero, this is just parabola of this kind. So this is R equals zero. And when um, R is positive, then I start enthusiastically like the rules, multiplying, producing more and more and more beautiful virial brethren until there isn't, you know, enough cells to infect things go bleak on me and i get this kind of population so this is r larger than zero now if i draw a picture that i told you before picture like this you know where the fixed point is a function of r they look it looks like this uh, Origin is stable, attractive. So make it thick green line for all R negative. When I get a critical point, something happens. Because, you know, the other point was always existing. This guy was existing. I can draw it like that. But it was unstable. Now what happens when I go to the critical point, transcritical point? From now on, origin is unstable. And the other fixed point, which used to be unstable, is now stable. So this is the transcritical thing. And it's used very nicely in Strogat's book. I recommend you just read it because what he now does, he does exactly this calculation, but he gives names to various parameters, arguing what a laser would look like. Um, I'm saved by the bell. I don't have to do it. But, you know, the physics of a solid state laser is that it's a device that has mirrors at two ends. You pump energy into it. So you pump light into it. And what that light does is it excites the atoms and then they emit light. So in the beginning, when you don't pump very much, this is just a light bulb light bulb, some light comes out. But then a uh, uh, very simple argument tells you that if you pump hard enough, you will get into this regime, this one, and suddenly you'll be producing lots of light. And that happens to be a transcritical bifurcation. Uh, but it haps, happens to be, you know, a starting point in understanding stimulated emissions. And why is this a nonlinear problem? When uh, you don't put much energy into it, individual atoms uh, individually fall from excited to ground state and remove the light. But when they start seeing that their neighbors are all producing light, they lock in step and they do it proportional to the density of the neighbors. 
and that becomes a quadratic function of the thing that we just studied in transcritical bifurcation. And there is a critical value where they all lock and step and they lay, you know, emit light together, and that's a laser, one way to explain it. Okay. I'm a free man.